last week I took you through the manuscript history, the progression of who moved the elect, the word elect in your King James. Now having showed you that, and there is a good reason why I've spent the time to camp out on this word elect, which begins your verse 2, 1 Peter uh, 1, 2. And what I've done today is I've put essentially what is verses 1 and 2, leaving off grace unto you and peace be multiplied, and I'll explain that in a minute. The body, verses 1 and 2, are essentially a greeting. And this is where my mind has to find the right words, because I don't want to abase scripture by making a, a, a bad comparison. But you ever buy a product, take it home, and the label inside says, congratulations on your purchase of blah, blah. Now, before we get into you opening up your new mer merchandise, let's give a few disclaimers here. And let's tell you what the product is capable of doing. And then usually the very end of that whole marvelous orb of uh, beautiful words has some clause of protection, a copyright, and a thank you very much for your patronage. It is going to people, a product, merchandise, unbeknownst to the person who is producing the product. In this case, Peter knew, and forgive me for making the analogy, but Peter knew to whom he was writing in that circle of places we've highlighted on the map. He knew to whom he was writing. And these are these people living amongst the people in this general area which we have covered. What people forget is that 1 Peter 1 and 2, uh, I'm talking about verses 1 and 2 out of 1 Peter, Chapter 1 is a salutation. You know, I, I always have to say this carefully. I don't think that Peter was getting into very deep theological and ideological, uh, unless I had one more logical, soteriological uh, meanings in his salutation. Okay? And keep this in mind because it is still a greeting. Do you remember when Paul wrote the Galatians in the opening and he took five verses or so to say a greeting and then he rolled up his sleeves and he got down to business and you know, he said, now I marvel you are so soon removed from. Remember that? All right. Well, every letter has to have some type of form and this one has this. So these few verses, are a, they are a salutation, they are a greeting, and they're giving the, basically uh, an introduction I am Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, to whom he is writing, and the reason, the undergirding of the whole letter sits in there, but it's in an introduction form. Now, this is what happened. As I showed you last week, Erasmus, in his translation, took this word, eklektois, and moved it and put it right in front of the foreknowledge of God, forcing an absolute criteria that these elect and the foreknowledge of God were attached. And I must say that they are. But here's why I do grammar. I'm going to show you something which will sort out, and I'm sure there are a few grammarians and a few, uh, we've got some people that join us from different theological uh, schools, will be more than likely to have a few ideas to chomp on later on in the day. But let's start first with making, again, the translation, just to be sure here we have Peter, and I'm adding, what I'm adding, I'm putting in brackets for reading. We know that, by the way, A is not, we don't translate, there is no such thing, there is the definite article, the in the Greek, but not an indefinite article. So it's added for the sake, and anything I put in brackets is added for the sake of speaking and saying it out to you now. So Peter, an apostle, and we said this is of, so of Jesus Christ, and this is a genitive that belongs together, so we don't say of Jesus, of Christ. Dative, to, and I'm going to translate this to, chosen, 
ones. And I'm adding this for sake of, of translation. Two chosen ones. We're going to use the King James word, and I'm putting it like this. I really don't like the word strangers, but it's much easier for the sake of for this discussion right now. I've already identified that these are people living among the populace, the demois, the so people who are living among the people, essentially, we sing the song, this world is not my home. Essentially, this word is representing those people who live in a place, but they're not making this place their permanent forever abode. They're not nomadic wanderers, and they're not strangers like, hey, who is that over there? And they're not pilgrims just discovering the land. Oh, we just discovered, here's Bithynia, we just discovered it. He's not saying that. All these words can be misleading. So, but I'm going to use the word, the King James, for the sake of this discussion to make it easier. Strangers, facility. But I've already explained that word to the chosen ones, those living amongst the people of... There is no... You can see here there is no the of... And I'm going to put of the dispersion... We know it's of the diaspora, but it, there is no the, so it is not identifying a specific event P of genitive, of Pontus and Galatia. These are all genitives of, of Cappadocia. Let me abbreviate, of Cappadocia, of Asia. This is the whole kit and caboodle put up here. Chi and Bithynia of Bithynia, genitive, of, all right? And here comes verse 2, and I wanna, I'm going to point out something to you, but let's first translate this. According, according, and this is in the accusative, so according to foreknowledge, foreknowledge of God, and I'm now putting in the definite Article the for the sake of reading of the Father. In your King James reads, and I'm putting quotations here, in sanc sanctification, sanctification, genitive of spirit, and it is suggestive because it is genitive, it is referring to the Holy Spirit, although it is not said. And I'm going to translate this better for you, but right now I'm going to put here resulting. Ice is a preposition, it's small, it can mean many things, but in its accusative case can imply resulting in, and you grammarians can go and check me out, or producing hupakoi. We tr get that English word from the Latin obedience, and chi, and this word for sprinkling, sprinkling, genitive of blood, Jesu Christu, of Jesus Christ. And I'm not giving you the last part of that greeting, grace and peace be multiplied, because it surely is part of this, but I'm focusing on this, grace and peace we've just covered. I'll tackle it again. It, the letter begins and ends with grace and peace, so uh, we'll have plenty of time to tackle that. There's a reason why I really felt the need to hammer this home and pick this apart. In the English language, and no, I'm not going to teach you grammar every week, but this is important. In the English language, there are parts of the sentence structure that must be there in order to form a correct sentence, parts of speech. In the Greek, there are certain grammar rules that apply. This writing is extremely bizarre for one reason, and I say it's very unique and bizarre. We've seen Paul's writing, and it seems like the Apostle Paul's writing has a good balance to it. Somebody said this is the pen, the writing of a very learned Greek person, so it can't be Peter. And I listen, I, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm just going to tell you it's extremely bizarre. And the reason why it's bizarre 
is until you get down to the word multiply that closes out this whole section, multiplied, which is the last word in our English, is the only verb in that whole ordeal. So it would be like we would be speaking and communicating a thought, and I'm now leaving off grace and peace be multiplied. There's no verb in here. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there are no, you'll notice there are no definite articles. There's not a definite article in here. There are particles, a preposition, in. And there's another preposition over here, and there's another one here, but there's no the. So its form is very strange to begin with. This had me very disturbed, and I'm going to tell you why. Because as I read every single translator's and every single commentary, I thought, there's something wrong here, and I just, I just don't see it yet. And I labored and labored and labored over this until I said, okay, I'm going to go back to the basics. I want to teach you some basics. If you know these things, they're good review, and if you don't, don't, don't think about mastering them in a day. Just hear what I'm saying. It becomes really important. If you can't read Greek, you can at least read. I've put these letters here, which are English letters signifying that Peter is a noun in the nominative, masculine, and singular. I'm glad that Peter is a male and singular. <laughs> and a noun in the English is person, place, or thing. In the Greek language, the way you find the subject, it doesn't matter. The subject can be any word. It can be a verb. It can be an adjective. It can be anything that holds the nominative case. So these are the only two nominative words in this whole sentence structure. So I had to first identify who is the subject of what's being said. You see, all the people who chronicle about the elect are continuously attaching the elect as if the foreknowledge of God must absolutely be connected, and it is, but the grammar shows something much clearer. And that's when this journey began. I said, okay, I see these technically here would be, Peter would be the subject, technically, and a proper name. And apostle is appended describing something, even though it's a noun, it's describing some position that Peter and apostle, all right? Um, it's, I'm going to put some abbreviations here. It could also be a predicate nominative, which is just being attached here to this word. Now, having identified the subject, who is Peter, an apostle, that next forces me to highlight, well, who are the elect and what role do they play in the sense? You'll see why grammar is important. The elect people over here are in the dative. And describing a people that live among a people are in the dative. And these people, these elect, these chosen, that live among the, amongst the populace of the diaspora, their dative case tells me something that's going to make me understand about the foreknowledge of God and how the foreknowledge of God is related to. Who is it related to? And how does it affect them? Now you say, why, why go through this exercise? That's very laborious. I can't even speak English most of the time. <laughs> because the mass confusion in English forces us to look back at these things. And as I said, I'm not going to bring you into a heavy grammar lesson every week, but I really feel the necessity to do this. So let's look at a few parts of the speech here. Um, if this Peter, an apostle, is the subject, all right, if Peter and Apostle is the subject, and the dative case will let me say that this is the indirect, indirect object. Now, why is that? Why do we need to know that, that the dative case is indirect? It means, and I'm going to read you, it's a very succinct way of putting this. The dative case, the elect living amongst the strangers of the diaspora in the dative case is used to show someone the elect, or something, the elect, other than the subject, Peter, or the direct object, the foreknowledge of God, who are being affected by or interested in 
an action or state of being. Now, if you're a grammarian, you're going, I get it, I get it, I get it. And if you're not a grammarian, you're going, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> All right. Let's look at this case here, and I'm going to try and string it all together for you. The accusative case states what is the direct object. In this case, the foreknowledge of God, the Father, is the direct object. And the direct object, I'm going to read this to you, is used to show motion toward something, all right? And this case, the accusative, accuses the subject, Peter, of what it is, what it has, or what it will do. Now, I've used these. They're helps, all right? Accusative is, you did it. I'm pointing the finger at you. You did it. Yes, Doug, you did it. <laughs> Doug's always the person I like to point at. You did it. Accusative. Dative suggests we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit inside standing in something. And genitive is when it's flowing out of the person or motion out of. So this grammar gave me the tools to figure out two things. Both Peter, an apostle, and the elect chosen living amongst a populace are both being affected by the foreknowledge of God. See, every time this letter is read, people take the elect according to the foreknowledge of God and treat the elect as though that word even conjures up some very interesting ideas. Yes, they were chosen people, but it, it leads to an erroneous idea about something. And I'm going to try and at least go back a few times and clarify. You don't need to know all of these areas here, let me cross this off. You don't need to know about Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. These are just the areas where these folks were dispersed into, okay? We crossed out that much. You don't have to deal with that. Wow, eliminated a little bit there, okay? So now we're dealing with, and I've already said to you, Peter, Petros, Apostolas, he is the sent one. The sender is Jesus, the sender of Peter, the initiator to send. Jesus said two things. We read the end of Matthew's gospel, and I'll take Matthew's gospel as the, the commission to go out and teach and preach. So, Peter's charge being sent of Jesus Christ, and Peter also was given another directive by Jesus. He said, you remember he said, when you're converted, go and strengthen your brothers. Remember he said that? So, we have to conclude that Peter is not only a part of the foreknowledge of God, that the elect are also affected. Let me read again what happens in the dative case. And I'm going to use my board to draw another grammar box because I have no room here. Well, maybe you, if you can see it, it'll be a mini grammar box. How's that? This is the box. It's a very miniature box. All right? So moving this way. And when I say a grammar box, let's pretend for a minute. Oh, we've got to use Doug. Doug is the good victim. All right? <laughs> Doug, you, you're going to be the grammar box, okay? All right, so if, if I stand here and point at you, I'm in the accusative, pointing towards you, right? And if Sylvia, your wife, jabs you with something, that would be motion into, like she just woke you up, right? <laughs> it's not that joke, folks. <laughs> that would be accusative. Dative would be on in or under. Doug is in the chair. Dative. Doug is under the chair, <laughs> hiding from Sylvia. <laughs> Doug is on the chair. It's like that. When I use a grammar box, people say, what does the box represent? It represents the motion of the words. So I want to make sure we're clear. This, if, listen, if you're not interested in learning about what it really says, I really don't know why you're here. But if you're interested in learning, you've got to apply a little bit of discipline, and it, it's worth it in the end. Genitive is what is coming out of or away from this box. So now, take Doug back in his chair again. Doug is 
running away from his chair. <laughs> he is, the motion is away from, because Sylvia may be motioning that she's running after him now. <laughs> yes, these are my grammar uh, examples of the day. See how the box works. All right. So, having at least tried to show you its motion, a lack of motion, motion to or away from, these people in the dative, I want to make sure we're sure that we're not talking about some select group that was taken out of here in the Genesis and moved away from, which is the idea that people carry when they say the chosen or the elect. He's talking about a people that are sprinkled and scattered everywhere, according to the foreknowledge of God. But here's the beautiful thing. Peter is not exempt. So, you know, sometimes in, um, in the Apostle Paul's writing, he uses the word we, and he says, we were like, we, we were all, and he includes himself. This grammar lets Peter be included too. So the foreknowledge not only is limited to the people, it's not limited to the people that are receiving this letter. It's as if I took this and I distributed it, and whoever will read it, versus the fact that the subject, Peter, an apostle, is also affected. Let me go back and read my definitions again, just to make sure. The date of case, let's talk about the elect strangers. This case is used to show someone or something other than the subject, which is Peter, the apostle, an apostle, affected by or interested in an action or state of being, affected by. What I'm showing you, essentially, is when we go back to read your King James, we read in the text, and it sounds as though these people that Peter, are, that Peter is sending this letter to, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers and so forth, that elect is limited to those people, when in fact... God's calling and God's choosing still continues today. And God's calling and God's choosing, obviously, is depicted clearly here when Jesus said, when you're converted, go back and strengthen your brother. So there's a foreknowledge that is not limited, which is the error that I find many people make. Now, having said that, if you didn't get the grammar, don't worry. It took me a very long time to understand. I told this, I said the story on festival. I used to sit in the church when uh, Dr. Scott had just begun teaching on Romans, 1999, 2000. It was between Genesis and Romans, and he started into the objective genitive and the subjective genitive, and I would leave the church going, <laughs> just, <laughs> all right? And until you really roll up your sleeves and you discipline yourself, and it doesn't take that much, you begin to figure out that these are the things that, that make it crystal clear. It sounds so complicated at the first, but man, when you get these concepts, it crystallizes things. Now let's look at the foreknowledge of God for a minute. And let me demonstrate this. Kata, according to foreknowledge. Now let's talk about this case. God to whom the foreknowledge belongs. This is why you have the genitive here of God the Father. The, the, the foreknowledge belongs to him. That's what the genitive tells you. It's not somebody else's foreknowledge. It's his. And this case is so cool because it lets me know in the accusative God is, was reaching his hand from eternity into time to a people. Now, go back with me for a minute. In the Old Testament, you'll find peppered through the Old Testament the concept of God choosing his oracle people and God choosing a people. And these concepts are repeated through and through. God reached in from eternity's perspective into time and chose himself a people and took this people to himself. He chose these people, and he took them to himself, and he said, you will be my people, my oracle people. And it was to those people that he gave the written word, the first written word that no one could keep, the law. In that framework of God reaching his hand 
from eternity into time. This is what the accusative case lets me see, that God reached into time for these people who were scattered, reached into time with Peter, at some point reached into time in our lives. And the biggest correction I want to make clear that people don't get hung up on somewhere else in the Bible. This may be imperative to learn about, like in Romans. In Romans, the elect is a verb, and there's an action in that verb, and God is the, is the person performing. It's active. He's performing the action on the people. In this case, this is an adjective. It's just telling me something about the people. It's not an action. Is that clear? All right. Because the only other place where this noun, or this, I'm sorry, this concept of, uh, forgive me, I'm, the only other place in the Bible where you're going to encounter this uh, elect, eclectois, as I've said, in the middle voice, where God is choosing a people for himself. So you've got an adjective describing a people, describing them, or God choosing the people and taking them to himself. And beyond that, people come into these great doctrines that I think if it's just left here, it's understood. Peter is writing on the basis of the authority of Jesus Christ as sending him to these people, whomever they are. Now let's discuss the elect before I leave this subject briefly. In Matthew 20, please don't turn there. In Matthew 22, it is the banquet uh, the wedding banquet, wedding uh, celebration. And if you read that carefully, the close of that, Jesus says, many are called and few are chosen. This is why I refuse to, to let people determine, particularly many of the commentators, what the concept of election in this passage means based on how Jesus used it when he said many are called and few are chosen. Think about this. Let me take you to that banquet for a minute. And he sent out God the Father. It's a joyous time, a time of celebration. Isn't a marriage supposed to be celebratory and happy? He sends out invitations and says, the banquet is prepared, the provisions are made. Go call the people. And they refused to come one time. We know that this parable is representing the Jews, those who refuse to hear about Jesus and this great celebration. And a second time, the servants are sent out. Go announce to the people, and they refused. And this time, it says, they made light of it. They thought it was just some, some silly thing. In fact, it doesn't really specify what they made light of. Did they make light of the celebration? Did they make light of the messengers? Or did they make light of what the Father was saying? All I know is it says they made light of it, and those that were invited, one went back to his farm, the other went to his merchandise. Typical working, it is, it's a, it's a, this work and the world is more important and mammon is more important than attending this celebration. And if you keep reading, it's explaining who are the called, because the callers went out and called the first time, and they called the second time, and then it says God was very angry, and slew the people. I like God. <laughs> you know, I'd be kind of mad, too, if I was making a big celebration. Somebody said, no, I can't. Why would I want to go? It's a celebration. It's a wedding celebration. And obviously, representing the, the bride and bridegroom, Jesus and his church, his people, and if you keep reading down, it says he sent out other servants. He sent them out into the highways, and he called both good and bad. That's what I love about the scripture. You have these holiness, perfectionist people that say, well, only the people who are perfect and good can come. No, 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 no. It says right there, both good and bad were called and invited in. Good and bad. Good and bad. They were all invited in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Those are the called. Those were the called. And that parable ends with many are called and few are chosen. And the few being represented, the few chosen are the ones that understand 
who do get the reality. It is not a performance. It is not a select group of people. It is the faith in Jesus Christ and the operation of all the completeness that happened at Calvary, that his blood, we sing the songs, his blood washes white as snow. The sprinkling and cleansing of your heart, the purifying, people come up with all kinds of ideas except this one. The chosen are those who have not only been called and called to come by God, but those who have heard and have connected in faith because it's the only criteria. It is the only criteria to get in that we have faith in him, that his whole work that he did, sufficient, debt canceled out, my sins and your sins washed away. This is why there's so many damnable doctrines that people bring into the church. Oh, let's, let's have some uh, uh, new creation ideas about how salvation comes to man and how we can keep making you relive every dreadful thing in your life because we just have to make you come and talk about it so you can just stay in the state, wallow in your dirt instead of accepting and recognizing the reality that Christ's blood has washed you clean and made you a new creature and get on with living in Christ instead of trying to still hold on to that old flesh nature that brought you down anyway. You know, I get, I get angry at this because people frustrate the grace of God. Now, I'm highlighting the called and chosen for a reason. It didn't say that those who were, when he says many are called and few are chosen, the ones that were called go back and in your leisure time read the parable again and recognize he called the Jews, they didn't respond. He called again, this shows you the Father's patience and mercy and that he would extend another invitation to call these people again and then says they weren't worthy go out and go and call go in the highways now this is excuse me I have a sidebar for a minute while all the scalp hunters of the of, of the the body of Christ those Christians who insist on using text out of context if there was ever a scripture that's, that would give a directive of people going and doing something. It's right there, though. These were his chosen servants going out into the highways. Please don't do that. <laughs> Not in L.A. anyway. You'll get killed. <laughs> Four, five. Oh, wait. <laughs> I must tell you about Jesus. <laughs> oh, boy. See, that's why you need a little humor sandwiched in now and then. But what I'm telling you is if you read that again out of Matthew in your own time, you're going to see the called were first a group of people select, and then the called became anyone who would hear the voice of the sayer and come to it by faith. And the chosen are those who responded in faith. And I'm sorry. You, if you interpret that any other way, you're going to get into this selection group of perfected, uh, warped legalism that now produces a performance uh, of, of Christianity that was never intended. There's only one criteria for anyone who is serious about getting real with God. God's Word just lays it out perfectly clear for those people that fuss he is looking for people to trust him, and that is to faith in his word and his son. One and the same by my eyes. So when we speak of the elect, I want to make sure we don't get into some elitist group. God knows who he wants. And like that parable, when it speaks about they went into the highways and they called the good and the bad, it means, and probably some ugly ones too, <laughs> good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> called them all in. Come on in. Come on in. So, I, I don't want to camp out too much more on this because I feel it will truly settle as we move through the letter. We'll encounter this word again. But I do want to talk about foreknowledge, which is where I started some 20 minutes ago. And who knew? Except God. All right. <clears throat> as a noun... <laughs> As a noun, the foreknowledge of God occurs only in one other place 
in the Bible as a noun, only in one other place. Book of Acts, Peter's sermon, day of Pentecost. So when I said, remember last week and two weeks ago, I said some internal evidences to support the writing that this is definitely Peter who followed Jesus, who walked for a little time on water and then sunk, that guy, versus some other guy, is that Peter on the day of Pentecost is using this very word as a noun. It's the only two places where it occurs in the Bible. There's little internal evidences like that that just kind of give you confirmation we're talking about Peter. Yes, that guy, all right? Impetuous Peter, now Mr. Pentecost. As a noun, it is functioning as I've described from, coming from God. It's not the foreknowledge of it's not the foreknowledge of the Apostle Peter, and it's not the foreknowledge of the elect. It's the foreknowledge of God. And this is why I said to you, I love how grammar works. This whole phrase is going to take you through some idea of how brilliant, in just these few words, contain a power-packed punch to the recipients and to the writer understanding a little, just a small little bit about what the rest of the letter is going to speak of. According to kata, according to, that is God, the foreknowledge coming and stemming from God the Father, and God the Father putting his hand from eternity into time, in, in, this word sanctification, in sanctification. Now this is why I spent some time talking about the elect and about foreknowledge because this word becomes a little bit of a freak show. See, all of these words that end in kishin, sanctification, justification, they were all pretty much coined out of the Latin. And they don't, as you can see, there's no connection. You know, sometimes we have words that have cognates like this word here, eclectois, if you look to the English, you'll see the word elect. You'll see the word, if you look at the word eclectic, you'll see, or ecclesiastic, you'll see cognates that stem from the Greek. Here, there's absolutely no connection. And this reverse aspirate makes it sound like ha, hagi, hagiosmo, all right? So there's no connection. These words, all these sanctification words came out of the Latin stream, and this is where language gets important. Sanctification is an important part of Scripture if it's understood, and we're going to use sanctification, but I'd like to take a minute to explain why I don't like the word. See, sanctification has produced, from about the time of uh, Wesley and uh, Fletcher, has produced one stream of people from this sanctification group, and on the other side of the fence, a person like Whitfield and uh, uh, the songwriter, uh, Augustus Toplady, or whatever his name is, uh, two on one side and two on the other, speaking of what sanctification is and isn't. And many polarized ideas have become perverted in the church, forcing p poor saints, yes, here's a good word for you, Poor saints, which actually comes from this Latin word. Poor saints, and anyone who is listening to the word called and listening, if you're sitting here in front of me, you're a saint. And that word gets a little bit more caricatured as we step through time and enter into the Roman Catholic Church where only dead people can be saints. <laughs> if I have to wait until I die... No, thank you. It says, my complete, if you will, using the Latin term, my complete sanctification will occur when I die and get my heavenly body, if you will. But in the meantime, I am a, I am a saint, and I'm being made, uh, conformed to Christ's image and likeness daily, not by my own means, but by a deposit of His Spirit put in me. Now, sanctification occurs, and we're going to use this word, sanctification occurs by way of Genesis, the Holy Spirit. So don't, please don't talk to me about sanctification 
If you don't understand the working of the Holy Spirit, that is something impossible to describe. The triune God, you can't take it and divide it like a piece of pie and say, well, this part is the Father and this part is the Son and this part over here is the Holy Spirit. I don't know. There's no possible way, I'm sorry, there's no possible way to peel it apart and say definitively. And anybody who tries to, I wish you God's speed. Good luck and farewell. <laughs> but at least this we know. The genesis of the spirit, the genesis, the emanating force, is still rooted in the Father, the ultimate generator, if you will, of all things. And I don't understand the mystery beyond that except to say that this separation, this sanctification that occurs does not occur on its own. One cannot act sanctified. These are all the ideas that I have to cover as I go through this because there'll be people that say, well, well, if somebody is sanctified, that means that they don't sin anymore. You ever, you ever hear that? You ever hear that? I haven't sinned since I was sanctified. <laughs> yeah, you just lied, though. Lying's a sin, too. So, let me talk a little bit about some of these concepts because they're important. When you go back into the Old Testament, you find that God, again, has a great deal to say about this word we're calling sanctification or holy. And we've defined it here in simple terms, something that has been uh, put to the exclusive use of the deity, put and committed to the exclusive use of God. But let's put some imagery on this. The vessels that were created for the tabernacle. They were vessels designated and specifically used from the time that those metals were brought and used and created into something else. God's the ultimate recycler, by the way. <laughs> and then those vessels became used exclusively in the tabernacle. They may have been some other form of metal or some other form of something before, but they became, the minute they were put into that area, they became exclusively used for God. Now, this is an important concept in explaining how God does separate certain things. Would it be proper then for the priest to come in and use those, let's, let's say God said, you're going to have a spoon for some type of fork or spoon to uh, take the coals or tongs. Strange fire, remember that? Get the tongs. And those particular things are going to be used exclusively for me in this place. And here comes one of the priests. You know, there's no harm in it. Listen, I, I don't think God will mind. I'm going to borrow these things. I'm going to make a barbecue at home. I need these tongs. I'm going to take them home and make a barbecue. I'll bring them back tomorrow. I think God would have probably struck that person dead. And guess what? Perfect example is that strange fire being taken. Do you remember that? Passage of strange fire. God didn't say it was okay. So these things that were committed remain committed and they remain used for, dedicated and offered to God. And frankly, it didn't matter where it came from, from the outside. The minute it became dedicated and committed, it belonged to God. Now, we take those ideas and we transport them into our brain and they come out on the other side as, I must be perfect now. I must go and sin no more. I must act right, be right, and do right because that's the perfect definition of sanctification. That's what Brother So-and-So told me. And you'll find out that Brother So-and-So is probably locked in his closet doing some things that no one would ever dare even utter. So... <laughs> That's not called sanctification, that's called hypocrisy. Just thought I'd tell you that. Uh, yes, and you'll have to forgive me if I keep it real, but the reality is I'm so tired of people taking things and making doctrines that are not. Now, what is holy, and what is the definition of sanctification through the Old Testament? Mount Sinai is referred to as holy. That was the mount that only, at, at one point, specifically, when Moses went up, the definition of that separating act in the Hebrew becomes two streams. 
One, to shine brightly like light, as in the Shekinah, that type of separating act. And the other one is to merely cut or separate sideways. So Hebrew keeps it very simple. And I love the fact that if you trace our word for holy, you find something really great. You find that from Old Norse. In fact, I've got it somewhere here in a, in a whole pattern of language development from, from holy, our English word holy, from the Proto-Germanic, which is, I hope I pronounced this right, Kailahas, which is Old Norse halig from Old Norse helgar, with some connection to this word, hal, which in our English word gets related to health and wholeness, which somehow takes me back in some strange dimension to the act that what was holy in the beginning, which was God's original creation of Adam and Eve, had perfect health. There's some attachment somewhere to that. Boy, now I just dangled a whole bunch of stuff for you. And our word for sanctification comes from the Latin and the French saint and has so many other streams away from probably the truest, best meaning that I've just described for you there. Now, I can tell you this much. Looking at least in the examples from the Old Testament, we've got some imagery of sanctification or separation. And I would include the fact that when Moses went up on that mount, which was God's mount, so it belonged to him, separating from all other mounts that may have been, that mount referred to as the holy mount at some time. I just kind of remarked the fact that when Moses came down, remember when his face was radiant and he'd seen some part of God's glory somehow? All right, so there is an attachment to this somehow. We'll trace the root and do a better, more in-depth study, but I do want to talk about sanctification, that word, in the New Testament, to show you Jesus' use and what it means to us, Jesus' use. Please, if you will, go to uh, John 10. And verse 36 is where I'm highlighting. I want you to see how Jesus speaks of himself. Now, listen, the Jews are standing there and accusing him. They, they were going to stone him. John 10, I'm starting at verse 31. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified. Jesus is speaking of himself. And that word for sanctified is the hagios word that I'm looking at right there. Say ye of him who the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now Jesus is speaking of himself and saying, he was sanctified, which tells you something. That word has a lot more to do with a separating, let's call it the separating from the, tri I'm going to make up a word, from the triunity. Because God, it says the Father sent him, there is more of an act of separation from the Father to place him or to send him into the world. My point is that this concept isn't so cookie cutter. When people talk about sanctification, they act as though it is an event and I'm sanctified. It's an event. No, it's not. Two things have to happen in sanctification. There is an outward activity and an inward activity. And you say, oh boy, you're going deep for me a little bit here. Well, that's good. You stretch your mind and come back to it at some other point. The sanctifying work that is happening here is in the dative, which means going back to my box right here, it is inside the person. The activity is happening inside. So there is a work of God when, when God's foreknowledge 
reaching into the flow of time, chooses, takes, going back to these people or to Peter, and the work of the Holy Spirit, the deposit of God placed in me, begins a work. And the complete sanctification process, if you will, will not be completed until I'm over there. So there are two events. There is the initial event, if you want to call it, of God separating, just as Jesus is speaking of himself. He does it again in John 17. And Paul will do it, by the way, before Agrippa, when he's making his apologia before Agrippa, speaking of this separating act. There is that one activity of God that then when the nature of God is placed in us, and this is, this is why I think God probably called me and placed me for this reason. I cannot fathom why people think that they can produce holiness. A whole many movements, the holiness movement. You heard of the holiness movement? Holiness movement. Women, cover your arms, cover your head, put a bag on your body. <laughs> men, whatever you do. I'm not sure what the holiness movement is for the men. I just <laughs> might not even want to know about it. There is nothing on the exterior portion of our being that we can make ourselves holy. I believe in the betterment. I believe in self-improvement and for the sake of the natural carnal man, the things we do to improve ourselves. But we're talking about the things of God. Now listen, if you and I as believers believe that we have had the Holy Spirit deposited in us, that is a part of God's nature, then by virtue of that belief, there is some activity that has separated me. I put my hand on my head as if there's a container that has opened up like a can where things have been deposited now, this deposit in me, that is God's nature separating me and that does not make me a vessel that is a robot or I go live in a monastery. It just means God has placed his nature in me and this whole idea of somehow purification. God is cleansing. God does the cleaning. That's why I love the Greek, the when Jesus speaks of the cleansing of the heart, he talks of the catharsis as a catheter that drains out. It's not some one event where you say, now I'm sanctified and I'm ready to walk according to the principles and I'll never fall off the track again. Oops! <laughs> it is a twofold thing. God is separating out, which belongs to this concept of elect, and it belongs to the concept of Jesus saying, when you're converted, go back and strengthen your brothers. And an ever-increasing activity. Let me ask you, how are we inwardly conformed to the image and likeness of Christ in our flesh container if it's not by the activity of the gift and deposit of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us? It's by no other means. So all of these holiness nutty people, oh, you gotta, gotta act pious. Let me read you something. I know I'm going a little bit late, but I hope you don't mind. I, I really feel an hour is just not enough to talk about God, and I, feel, I don't know how people manage to survive on 20-minute soundbite sermons. Uh, I'm reading something to you in French, but it's out of Lang's commentary, volume 12 from Zondervan, we always give credit for whatever I'm reading from. <clears throat> this would be the commentary on um, the first epistle of Peter, and it's a section, I'll just read it to you, it's just a few lines, it's French, and then I'll translate it for you, because I guess that's my specialty. <clears throat> Il vous a séparé effectivement avec eux, non pas en vous sanctifiant comme il fit le peuple d'Israël au désert. He says, he separated you with them, not in sanctifying the people like he did out of Israel, with a sanctification, d'une sanctification externe et corporelle seulement, not with an external sanctification. The people were sprinkled and it was an outward activity. But this writer says, 
lorsqu'il le fit arroser du sang de la victime qui raffia par sa mort l'alliance de la loi. Their sprinkling could only bring them to the law. An external functioning. I don't need to read any more. I'll give you my own translation from the rest of this. There had to be some inward work. This is why this whole introduction will lead us into the letter explaining a powerful message to those people who will hear and receive it, separated by the power of God, cleansed not like the Jews and the people of Israel by some external sprinkling and by some external activities, but an inward working more powerful than anything that a mere mortal man could put on you, spray on you, or bless on you. Hey, that's it. You know, we'll just convert some of the, you know, you've heard of those tanning beds where people go and they get sprayed? We'll just have holiness booths. <laughs> and sanctification booths. And you go in that booth, and somebody sprays air on you, and now you're sanctified. But it's likened to that. And that's not the way God works. He says, I've placed something in you. This is why the church can't stay the way it is. The true church of Jesus Christ is being conformed daily and is being changed daily into his image. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be conformed to somebody else's image. I don't want to be conformed to sister so-and-so. I have my own nature, and you have your own nature. But to the image and likeness, that conformity can only occur from glory to glory by this inner working that's been placed in me and in you and by no other means. So this grammar, forgive me to go back to it, but this grammar that shows the dative, which shows me that this process is occurring inside the believer by way of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to say it to summarize it. The end product, this word ice right here, resulting in, producing, the end product where God's foreknowledge has reached down into the stream of time and separated in an inward deposit that begins first by him reaching his hand into time and then placing his spirit in you, produces, resulting in the hupakoi, the obedience. Obedience. You can't, I'm sorry. People say, well, you ought to be obedient to God's word. Well, not if you're not listening to God's word, hearing, and, and I'm sorry. The chosen group of people who are in the faith are listening to the voice of the sayer and running towards it and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He says this most powerful salutation. And, and I've taken the time to make a, a probably very long and tedious pulling apart. Haven't done it all. Didn't get to it all. But I just want you to know something. Nestled in this greeting... He says the concepts just to say the same way he came and the same way that these came, these elect and Peter. The first image in the Gospels, Jesus, follow me. The first image. Now he's calling the apostle through this sender, these same people, Follow me. And now I'm going to tell you that the knowledge, the foreknowledge of God the Father in this activity of separating out and placing in us His Holy Spirit result, results in the obedience and sprinkling. Not only am I obediently listening and running to the voice of the Sayer, that is God speaking through His Son, being delivered by Peter as the messenger, but I'm also cleansed. This word and this concept cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you, recipients of the letter. Now, let's talk about blessing God. Let's talk about your crisis temporary that you're going through. Big introduction. Big, big introduction. But you're going to find all of this is woven into the letter somehow. And I challenge you just... Go in your own time and look at all the references that he's going to reference to God the Father, Jesus Christ, and references to the Spirit. And you're going to find out that this is a small epistle 
packed with a lot of information for people like you and like me who are on a journey, those people who are scattered, making their way through, but this is not my final resting place and neither is it yours. So don't let anybody come at you with convoluted ideas about how somehow, good or bad, if you are just coming off some uh, drug high or if you're just coming into the church for the first time, God, by the way, he doesn't say, go get clean first. Oh, that's another religion, I think. Go get clean first, and then we'll go and wash yourself and put on nice clothes and look like you're going to church, and then we'll, and God, you and I can have a talk. God, look holy then, and I'll look clean. Remember what God said, what Jesus said to the Pharisees? He said, don't worry about, you worry about the outside of the cup. You might want to start with the inside, and that's where God starts. He takes us right where we're at, and he does the work inside. And all these exterior things, believe you me, when this flesh is laid down and we're standing in his presence, we're going to say, who was worried about this appearance thing more? Brother and sister holiness or God? He worked it out just perfectly. More to say, but that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.